My, my mum and dad, great godly people, and please excuse me if my eyes leak, they call tears of joy. But, you know, in this respect, my mum and dad couldn't have children nine years. My mum and dad married when dad was 29, mum was 21, and um, they lived in Grangetown. My mum was uh, born in America and came over here, did a lot of amazing story as far as that's concerned, but then she came here, met dad, uh, and they grew up, lived in Grangetown, went to Ebenezer Gospel Hall, and so on, many years there. Okay, but mum and dad couldn't have any children for nine years. Tried, went to um, fertility clinics and all that sort of stuff. In fact, so, so much so that my mother got real friendly with the consultant that she was visiting all the time, and uh, in the end, the consultant said, look, you know, Evelyn, you don't need to... You don't need to pay us anymore for coming with a consultancy. You know, we've become friends, and I, I, can't, I, I can't feel justified taking any money off you. We haven't done anything for you. For, you know, so, you know, let's leave it at that. But still continue to come. So, they came. She came. And she said to Mum those years ago, she said, Evelyn, you know, if you really had your heart's desire, what would you want more than anything else? She said, twin boys. So, um, so anyway, that's 1952 sort of or 19, you know, 51 at that time when that most probably was asked or whatever. And you know, she said, "Well, oh, wow, don't ask for much, do you?" You know. So anyway, that was it. Not long the word finished and so on. So you know, in that that circumstance, she said this. One day, she phoned her and she said, "There's a little boy come up for um, adoption in the nursing home in the the nursing home in Canton." And you ought, to, you ought to get and, and do something about that, Evelyn, and, and adopt him. So she said, oh, great, okay. So my dad said, you know, Harry, I'm going to go do this. Is this okay? Yeah, yeah, fine, okay. So she got in touch, but I don't know quite how she got in touch uh, anyway. But the situation turned out that as much as she was trying to say yes, the person in charge of the um, nursing home kept on sort of saying, oh, don't worry, Mrs. Mansfield, that's fine. You know, we fully understand. She said, no, 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 you don't. Yes, we do. We don't. You do. Anyway, it ended up at the end of the day that mum didn't have this little boy. And so you can imagine, I can picture it, you know, she goes home and, and dad just says, oh, so, you know, when are we having, uh, well, Harry, um, we're not. So you go, what? So she said, well, I tried to say yes, but the, the, the nurse, the sister, whatever in this place, just wouldn't take yes for an answer. She kept on saying, oh, I fully understand, and all this sort of stuff. So she said, we're not. And I think what happened in those days, boys were such a premium after the war with so many men dying and so on, boys dying, that, you know, she most probably offered them to half a dozen people, and one of them got in before mum or something, and so therefore, anyway, it was a negative. Well, that was that, and that little boy went up for adoption. But then came December 1952, that was September 52, December 52, and this lady phones mum again, this consultant lady, she said, you are never going to believe this, Evelyn, but... In the same nursing home, twin boys have just been born. And their little mother, just 15, is, is unable to obviously have them. So, you know, they're going up for adoption. Do you want to get down there like ASAP? Because this has been the desire of your heart, so you better get down there like straight away. So she took my two grandmothers, I think, just for extra force, you know. Went down there, and she, um, she, she picked us up and fell in love with us straight away. I mean, you, I can totally understand that. But, you know, in that... <laughs> In that circumstance, that's what happened. I think grandma, you know, dad's mum and mum's mum just cuddled us and, and she, she actually, mum says, and you can verify this story, she's in Bethel House there, you know, whatever, 90 year old now, and, and she sort of said, you know, one of you, I don't remember which one, but she said, one of you just reached up your little hand, just, you know, as young as you were, and you just grabbed my, my finger. And she said, ah, did it for me, you know, so, gonna have, so I went home and said to dad, you know, yeah, let's, let's do this. She, Dad said, this was December 2nd and 3rd. Dave, I'm, I'm the oldest by one hour, but Dave was awkward. He waited until after midnight, so we've got birthdays on different days. So anyway, she goes home and she says to Dad, she says, you know, yeah, this is, you know, Dad says, oh, oh hang on a minute, Evelyn. It takes nine months to prepare for one, and you want us to have two, like, straight away, you know. Whoa. Anyway, he waited until after Christmas, and then... Dad consented, and, and we came to live with them. Six months went by that is, is legally necessary, a necessity to come to a court day. And the day before court, mum and dad, they loved the Lord, and they used to get down by their, their bedside before they jumped into bed and, and just pray, thank God for the day, and so on. Go down by their bed, and uh, my mum said, Harry, I'm going to pray that if these twin boys were intended by God for us, 
then I fill up. <laughs> then I don't don't want to see another period until our own child is born. And I can imagine my dad saying, "Hang on a minute." <laughs> We've been, spent nine years with all the fertility clinics, etc., etc., and now all that's ending because we've got our twin boys and we're going to court tomorrow and it's legal and legally these boys are going to be ours. Then <laughs> you're now saying that you want confirmation from God and you just want to ask God if this has been absolutely right, that these twins were to be ours according to his will. You're not going to see another period until... Our own child is born. Yeah. I expect my dad said, you do the praying, I'll just say amen. You know, <laughs> because in that circumstances, that's what she did. And nine months to the day later, Paul was born. <laughs> and in his circumstances, the awesome thing, suppose we pulled Paul's leg forever and said, you, were, you had no chance to come until we were here. But you know, in that... But you know, that was absolutely phenomenally true, awesome story. But it doesn't just end there. Because the little boy that was born in 1952 of September actually never did get adopted because his biological mum and dad who were separated and messing around at the time and they just didn't know what they wanted, they changed their minds and they took the little boy back from the adoptive parents before they went to court. And so those adoptive parents lost out and they didn't have him. And he was, uh, you know, that was a very sad thing, but mum was relieved because that would have happened to her. She had been heartbroken. So, you know, she was sad for them, but glad for herself. Anyway, the years passed and we grew up. And then David was academically brilliant and I was academically the other way. And uh, <laughs> he went to grammar school. He went to Canton Hyper Boys. There was no way. Some of you might have been knowing Cardiff. There's no way I was going to Ninian Park. You understand why, if you were around at that time with Lillian Park. Initi initiation <laughs> ceremonies were not nice, and so I was not going to be going there. So I went to King's College, and I was there for two years. And I think it was not what you know, it's who you knew, because my dad was um, high up in the local authority and uh, ended up chief executive officer and all this sort of stuff. And, and that, but I think it was not what you knew, it was who you knew. And um, uh, Canton Hyper Boys decided they were going to allow me in at 13. I went into secondary school, into grammar school at 13, with, back with my twin brother. And, uh, you know, we, we survived, existed together, had a great time. David had their best friend, and, and I had one too. And my best friend, we were just inseparable and uh, did everything together. And, you know, suddenly, as we were growing together and just so much friend, we, we just were so at one. It was, it was quite amazing how much time we did spend together. Anyway. There happened to be a big Billy Graham crusade in, in Cardiff, and uh, it was relayed, I think, to Supply Gardens, possibly, and, uh, and, you know, many got saved. My best friend got saved that day. And when he went home and, and declared it to his mum, he was so excited about it and whatever, his mum, who now was divorced from his dad, and there were four boys, he was the oldest, she absolutely resented and hated the fact that he'd become a Christian. They were Egyptian, or he was a father was Egyptian background. I won't say name just for the minute, but some of you know me intimately, will know who this is. But you know, in that circumstance, um, his mother was going to throw him out. And uh, because he'd become a Christian, we were 14. And uh, you know, he said, I'm going to go, I'm going to go live under the bridges on the town. So I said, Are oh, you heck? You know, you're going to come home with us. I mean, crumbs, I mean you're not going to go live under bridges. You know, we, you know, Mrs. Mance is what everybody called my mother. Everybody was welcome in our house. So I said, come and live with us. You know, that's cool. It, you know, don't worry about it. We're five kids. One more, not going to make a difference. So, you know, come. I said, no, 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 I'm going to, you know, you're not going to. <laughs> oh, slept. You're not going to. So um, in that circumstance, he, one day, and this was the amazing thing, mom and dad had realized that my best friend, was the little boy. <laughs> that they had tried to adopt in September 1952. He was the same name. My dad was having the ability to know, do the research in, in his circumstances, and so therefore he realized that, yeah, this little boy, my best friend, was the little boy that they tried to adopt. And when he was thrown out by his parents, he didn't have anywhere to go. One day, he always called for me to go to school. We lived. 
we lived in um, just in London, and it was like two minutes to the school. So you know, we always used to get up. If the bell went at five to nine, we just managed to get out of bed about ten to. And so anyway, he would come and call on us just as we would um, as we go to school always. This one day he came and he called on us, and he had his two little suitcases, and he knocked the door, rang the bell, and uh, my mum goes to the door, and he says to her, "Mrs. Mance, would would you be my mum?" And uh, so. <laughs> He came and lived with us, and uh, he wasn't with us long. Excuse my emotion, because it's a, it's an awesome story. He um, he didn't live with us very long, because his grandparents came, lovely Christian people, and they came and they said, "This is so wrong that our daughters behave like this." You know, would would, would you mind if he came and lived with us? And we said, no, absolutely not. I mean, you're, you're his grandparents, for things sake. You know, yeah, absolutely. You know, that's great. Don't worry about that. That's great. So he went to live with his grandparents, was brought up then. I was his best man in his wedding. And, um, you know, it, it was awesome. He, he now knows that story. And he sort of said, you lucky. <laughs> you know, well, not quite that. But, you know, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. He was God, a father to the fatherless. My dear little mother, 15, or whatever, maybe she was just 16, but I think it was 15. There was no way she was going to keep these twins. My biological father was a minor, and he was already married and had a child. Couldn't afford for his wife or family to know anything about us twins. And so we were deemed, because he had not enough job time in the adoption papers, so I understand, but as far as life was concerned, we were deemed to be in an orphanage for the rest of our days. Who can take on two other than God organizes? And in that circumstance, when David comes and he speaks here in Psalm 68, he says, let me tell you from experience, when I was an outcast, I couldn't eat at their table. I couldn't do anything except go out to a field with the expectation I was going to die that day because a bear or a lion would come try and take the sheep and they would kill me in the process if I tried to protect them. In those circumstances, I learned that God was a father to the fatherless. And when the rubber hit the road, God anointed me to be king in Israel. And all those years he stood by the widow, my mother, because that's how she was treated, put to one side because she was a woman of adultery. And yet she never was. And God restored both my mother and me, King David would say, back to a position. Are you in a parched land? You're feeling that the circumstances of your life have dealt you a bad hand or a bitter blow. It's to come to this place that David said, that David came to. He said simply, God, I know all you desire is truth in the inward parts. And when we're like that, God becomes a father to the fatherless. Remember when we read there, I won't turn to it again, but when we read there, he gave his inheritance in the place of parchedness. And if you're in that position, come to God and say, I want to enter into your inheritance, God, for my life. I know the plans that I have for you. They're written in the book. And the book is written. And God wants you to come into line with what he has for you. And you can only do that through the cross of the Lord Jesus and through submission of yourself to his purposes in your life. I am so thankful to my mum and dad because they were just not able, they were not able to have kids, but they were available to God. You know, it, it is such a joy, and you can imagine why I'm so close to my mum. When, I guess, when you think of the wilderness that I got saved from, I guess, really, we were talking like this about this just as we were coming, even today. It's no irksome thing to me 
to ever pick up the downtrodden. Because God has given me an awareness of his grace that says, where's the next lame duck? Who is it next that you want us to be ministering to? God is so good. There is so much more in the psalm. I'll tell you, really, there is so much more. If you want to go read a story that is awesome, I was in time to honor, I'm not going to go into it, but go read the story of Mephibosheth. Because there David comes to a place, now he's experienced being the experience of a, having a father to the fatherless. And he says, turns around and says, who is there that's left of Saul's family? Of Jonathan's family? That I might show what? The kindness of God to you. And Mephibosheth is the one. You have a look how he was dealt with, where he was right out in the place of Lodabar, the place of no pasture. He was out of it, lame on both his feet, just dropped as they were running from the enemy in that circumstance by his nursemaid. And what did David do? He says, come. Not to knock your head off because you were a threat to the throne, my throne. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to sit you at my table because I know what it's like to be down there and not at my father's table. I'm going to sit you at my table. Because I want to show you the kindness of God. That when the Lord raises us up out of the parched land and he blesses us, watch what he does next in your life because he's going to get you to bless somebody else. Because of the richness of what you experience, there will be somebody that he will say, here, this one. And he said it to the people in Israel of his own day when they asked him, who is my neighbor? Jesus said, let me tell you a little story. I won't tell you that story. We'll leave that for Ken to do another day. But you know, in that, I'm sorry that I've just gone on, but I wanted just to share my heart and to share that story. You know, the, the practical reality of this word is amazing. It isn't just a bunch of doctrine and theology, etc., etc. It is practically worked out in the circumstances of man. And that's my story.